something like 80 or 90 percent of people who become Christian in places like Myanmar and China report personal experience with miraculous uh, healing. Now, yes, you can write off some proportion of, of those reports as wishful thinking, hallucination, sure. However, was I really willing to dismiss the testimony of millions of people? I got to a point where I couldn't. And so once you, once you destabilize that, uh, that anti-supernaturalist bias, that is really quite particular to, to this historical location, you know, sort of modern Western technological society. That, that opened up uh, ways of thinking about causation that I think changed how I had to view claims about the resurrection. Molly Worthen is an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a freelance journalist. Her research focuses on North American religious and intellectual history. She writes about religion, politics and higher education for the New York Times and has also contributed to the New Yorker, Slate, the American Prospect, Foreign Policy and other publications. Molly, thank you so much for joining us. It's very kind of you to give us your time. Thanks for having me. Can I just ask, first up, uh, you're American and you're somewhere in America. I'm in northwest New South Wales. You're in? I'm in the state of North Carolina, which is uh, in the southern part of the east coast of the United States, about four hours south of Washington, D.C. I teach at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is a, a big public university, about 30,000 students. Now, I've almost never met an American who lives and works anywhere near where they grew up. Is that where you grew up? It is not. Uh, in, in my profession, especially in the humanities fields, where there are not very many university jobs, you go where the jobs are. And so I've, I've been lucky to land here. It's a wonderful place to live. But I grew up outside of Chicago in the Midwest. Great. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Now, if we could kick off. Now, scholars and commentators talk about secularization. It's a word that's probably seen great change in its meaning over time. But if we say no, it might, what they're talking about might be better talked about uh, post-Christianization, especially in Western Europe and certainly here in Australia. America, though, still does seem different. Uh, it does seem more religious, if I can put it that way, by comparison. Do you see it that way? Is America different? And if so, why? Yeah, I think that the United States does have some special things, features in its history and culture that uh, have created a maybe a deviation from the broader pattern of Western civilization. If by secularization we mean things like rates of church attendance, what uh, people tell uh, pollsters when they call up and say, you know, do you believe in God? Do you pray and this sort of thing? And also I think when people are describing when they say secularization is the influence of traditional institutions of organized religion on the public square, on matters of, of public morality. So in, in all of those ways, I think there are pretty significant differences. Uh, Americans still attend church at, at higher rates. Uh, more of them claim some sort of religious affiliation. And I think uh, there are a few historical factors that contribute to that difference. So one is the more competitive, what you could call marketplace of religion created by the First Amendment to our Constitution, uh, that while not creating a total free-for-all, I mean, certainly uh, those religious groups that had power in the late 18th century, you know, continued to have some privileges compared to many other countries where uh, one uh, church has more of a kind of a firm, well-funded establishment, more cultural power, uh, the American scene, you know, really encouraged a kind of religious entrepreneurship, which uh, has led to a, a kind of lasting vibrance. I'd also point to uh, the range of immigrants who the Europe who settled this country after first European contact. So uh, really a, a pretty passionate and, and diverse range of religious expression in those early generations of immigrants. I think too, the role of religion in American racial conflicts 
is is something that has contributed to a kind of fusing of of uh, really a particular understanding of religion and ethnicity and culture for some subcultures in the United States at some points in time that has contributed to kind of the, the lasting vibrance. But I will tell you that in more recent decades, it has looked like the statistics are starting to carry America into what I could call the sort of Western post-Christian fold. I think it will take a while for uh, the demographic figures, the you know rates of church attendance and things like this that we see in America to catch up with say Western Europe, uh, Canada, um, how, and it, that may be uh, the, the, the big monkey wrench that may come is uh, changes in immigration. I mean, I think there is um, there is a scenario in which immigrants from other parts of the world, particularly the global south, do really alter the religious future of this country. But I can talk more if you, if you want about kind of that big picture of civilizational transformation that's been going on really since the Reformation, if you want. But the short version is, though, that I don't think the factors that have contributed to American exceptionalism have made America exceptional enough to step out of that broader civilizational narrative. I think we're caught up in it. So just to focus on one aspect of that, uh, I, I would imagine your churches are aging in the sense that um, younger people are moving away, particularly through their university experiences, uh, where it seems to me that campus life in America is has really adopted a very different worldview, one that is broadly not only um, different, but actually quite antagonistic towards a traditional Christian worldview. That's interesting. I'm not sure that the tension uh, that you're describing between the worldview of uh, mainstream secular universities and the worldview of traditional religious institutions is something that has changed, uh, particularly over the past few generations. I mean, we have pretty good sociological data that tells us that uh, universities have been, broadly speaking, to the left of American culture um, uh, in, in general. I mean, gosh, I mean, for, for at least a century, that's been true. So my own, my own university is located in a town called Chapel Hill. And you can go back more than 100 years and find conservatives in the state of North Carolina referring to my university as Red Hill because it was a den of atheistic socialists. So that tension you're pointing to it goes back uh, quite a long ways, long predates the real collapse in uh, religious faith and church attendance among younger Americans. So if we look at the, at the statistical data, it looks like the big change among Americans under the age of 35 began really in the 1990s. I mean, that's where we start to see significantly larger numbers of younger Americans uh, telling survey takers that they are no longer part of a church, they, they are pulling back from their, some of their traditional beliefs. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think you're, you're right to um, point to the, the sort of the, the tension uh, between those different uh, subcultures and institutions in America, but that's a, that's a long-standing pattern. And as I've studied the big picture of the history of secularization and the transforming role of organized religion, it has seemed increasingly to me that uh, faith and reason have always been in tension. You know, I think they've been in tension since the days of, of the ancient Greeks. And while there have been these crisis points, often featuring a prominent role for academia, uh, when some new set of uh, discoveries about the world really uh, caused a kind of intellectual earthquake among uh, Christians, especially, whether it's um, the uh, you know discovery of evolution by natural selection by Charles Darwin and the publication of his uh, seminal book on that in 1859, or uh, changes in biblical criticism in the middle of the 19th century, beginning in the German universities in which scholars began to treat the Bible as you would any other historical artifact. These were, these were seismic shifts, absolutely, um, often premised 
on assumptions about how you investigate the world, uh, where values come from that are quite different from traditional uh, religious groups. However, it has seemed to me that uh, religion adapts, that um, traditional believers uh, find ways to, to assimilate or at least new ways to think about those intellectual challenges. It seems to me that the, the, the real through line of secularization and the thing that has gotten sort of turbocharged since the 1990s is rather the elevation of personal subjective experience over all else and the total erosion of institutional authority. Uh, to me, that is the big headline. It, to explore that for just for a tick, um, and then we'll come back to some of the other things that uh, I wanted to focus on. Um, research does indicate, you, you touched on the idea of American exceptionalism uh, and uh, whether or not it can survive the changes in American um, outlook. Um, it does seem to me that you, you, you can trace the loss of patriotism and belief in America, more broadly, perhaps even belief in liberal participatory democratic capitalism, that's a bit of a mouthful, amongst younger people. So I understand older Americans are still very patriotic. Younger Americans, very few are patriotic. That's a massive change, particularly in the most powerful nation on earth. That's interesting. I mean, I think it's it's a story, uh, it, certainly in the American context, that you you would you would want to go back to uh, you know the Vietnam War um, and uh, and examine the the significant change uh, in the way, especially younger Americans began to to think about government authority, the role of America in the broader international scene in that context, and in so many ways, I see our current moment, especially on campus, um, as very much a replay of, of many of the dynamics uh, familiar from the late 1960s and early 1970s. I mean, in some cases, our student groups are very aware of these parallels. And, you know, we've had student groups on campus who've gone back into our archives and pulled up, uh, you know, manifestos by activist groups from the late 1960s and read those at their rallies, right? So the students themselves see these parallels. Uh, I think, though, that that, uh, that erosion of um, sense of commitment to, um, to a national project, a sense of being part of and loyal to a community much bigger, certainly than yourself and bigger even than your local community, a sense that you have something in common with a wide range of people who are part of a force that while it's, it's not infallible, is, is a, a presence for good in the world. I think you're, you're absolutely right that 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 sense has eroded, especially among younger Americans and especially on the American left. You know, the term patriotism has become kind of radioactive. And periodically I see you know, opinion pieces in, in the newspapers by liberals lamenting this, saying, you know, this is an enormous problem. And I think, you know, we, we can perhaps tease apart the degree to which in political discourse, certain terms uh, become ca captured. Uh, and associated with one political position in a way that is kind of misleading and unfair. So if you really were to sit down with, you know, every, every young, uh, you know, every college student, certainly at, you know, at a place like UNC and, and ask them, you know, in a detailed interview, you know, how do you really feel about your country? What are you hopeful about? What are you afraid of? I think a much more nuanced view would, would come to the fore. I mean, I'm, I'm in general pretty inspired by my students. I think, Cynicism is a problem, but it's it's maybe not as pervasive as we think. However, I mean, this has been the the the, the story of patriotism is in some ways a, a casualty of the the kind of polarization that we've seen, you know, which is of course not a uniquely American story, um, but but one in which you know this the fragmentation has uh, really ignited this this sense of of tribalism that I think is at odds with patriotism in its best sense, which should really overcome all those tribal narratives of the culture wars. Those young people that you that you say you're often encouraged by, uh, do they 
uh, themselves feel bombarded by bad news, by stories of a collapsing society, a dangerous world, climate change will get you. We read reports in my country about young people having vasectomies, young men, because they don't want to bring children into the world. And in fact, that you could argue that's reflected in absolutely collapsing birth rates in a great deal of the Western world, as well as in Asia today. Are they pessimistic or do they feel there are challenges out there, let's go and be heroes and tackle the challenges? Gosh, I think that they are, they do feel bombarded by bad news. They feel that uh, older older Americans have ignored uh, so many problems, particularly when it comes to climate change, that they're just sort of blithely passing along to the next generation. I also see um, a, a real, uh, a, a kind of a sense that they are gun shy when it comes to even having the, the tough discussions because they have lived their whole lives online, on social media, in a with a kind of performance and public presentation tied up inseparable from their process of learning about the world and deciding what they think. So, you know, how can you even begin to decide what your philosophy is, uh, what you think uh, leaders should do about the pressing problems of the day if you are constantly worried that, you know, a, a classmate who doesn't agree with you is going to, you know, post on, on you know, Twitter or TikTok, you know, some uh, garbled version of what you've said, you know, are you going to feel uh, free to, to stand up and ask a question of a speaker visiting campus if there's a chance that someone might be filming it and posting it on YouTube? And I think uh, students have kind of come through the, the, the elementary and high school system absorbing from a, the culture just a general sense of, I just want to be a nice person. I don't want to make any waves. Uh, you know, I, I want to get a job at the other end of this. I don't want anything on, on the internet that a potential employer could Google to my detriment. And, and so um, I just want to, I just want to uh, know what language I have to use and what I have to say to, to get along. And so they've, this is true even of, of students I have who, you know, have grown up in a, in a pretty traditional church environment, say, who, who may have, you know, when you, when you look at the, the worldview they've grown up with, and, you know, it may involve pretty exclusive truth claims that do uh, suggest, you know, there are lines, there are points of real disagreement. But uh, our, our culture has steered them away from kind of really wrestling with that. So one thing that we try to do at university, and I think, um, my, you know, as my colleagues become more aware of this problem, we're, we're getting better at, at finding ways to, to create the environment in our classrooms where students feel a greater degree of liberty to test out ideas, uh, to really express the things that deeply concern them, uh, to understand that, you know, college is a time when you ought to be open to changing your mind, uh, that, you know, you may have been fed this message that, you know, you're here because of something to do with your identity or where you're from in the country, Forget that, you know, you're at university to learn to be a sponge uh, because of what you can learn and change and, and how you can grow, not to sort of calcify into some settled identity. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the best way uh, to kind of chip away at the cynicism and the pessimism to awaken in students a, a sense of kind of exploration and, and potential. Coming to then an area of your, your expertise, uh, you're an expert on, amongst other things, evangelicalism. Now, again, as an Australian looking in, the term seems to be bandied around fairly freely and you wonder sometimes just what it really means. Often it's about political commentary uh, pertaining to America or, uh, uh, and people write off the so-called red states as a bunch of evangelicals as though they're, 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 they're uh, not well informed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are many um, academic uh, evangelicals, it seems, in your country that, uh, that are you know, able to argue with the best. What does the term mean and how useful is it as a way of describing a certain group of Americans? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, 
evangelicals themselves as well as well as people who study and write about them have been arguing about the term forever and i think we're, we're sort of stuck with it um like any term it you know it it, it depends on so much on context uh you know it, it can be some in some contexts a, a cultural label and others more of a theological label i'm a historian so my impulse is to define it historically and say that evangelicals are a network of christian groups that grew out of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, shaped profoundly by the great 18th century revivals in Europe and North America. And that is a network uh, that co-evolved in specific ways with the other big intellectual and cultural developments of Western civilization, particularly the scientific revolution and the enlightenment and the growth of Western democracy. So while evangelical theological beliefs uh, are, you know, in, in many crucial ways, quite, quite ancient, um, and, you know, evangelicals aren't making it up when they can, when they say that they can uh, draw lines between their understanding of, of salvation and, and Paul the Apostle, or, you know, their understanding of biblical inerrancy and, you know, someone like Bishop Irenaeus, there is something new and modern about evangelicalism. Uh, there is a, a, a stress among evangelicals across really all evangelical churches and traditions on individual, your personal connection to the divine. Uh, there is in the evangelical experience uh, something that is, is unique to the, to the modern story of jostling up against other ideological and religious groups in a pluralistic context and competing for believers. My own definition, uh, as I've you know written about evangelicals and tried to figure out a way to corral, you know, a, a spectrum of Christians ranging from you know tongue-speaking Pentecostals to super buttoned-up Southern Baptists to pacifistic Mennonites, is to focus on the shared questions that I think all of these Protestants sort of revolve around even if they don't agree on them. So I think those questions are, how do I know Jesus in a personal way? How do I reconcile faith with modern reason, specifically a high view of the Bible's authority? And then third, how do I navigate personal exclusivistic faith commitments in a pluralistic context? So some of, some scholars want to emphasize a, uh, a specific history that's more focused on ethnicity and politics and culture. That's all important. I would never uh, discount that. But I I'm more focused on this kind of historical theological through line when I define evangelicalism. Does that imply then that there's a sort of a continuity between the early believers? Uh, in early Christendom who uh, plainly took uh, uh, the whole Christian story, Christ on the cross, very seriously and were prepared to die for it with those today who are still very focused on the questions that the cross rise, uh, arise, you know, gives rise to. Is there a continuity through there? I think all. I mean, all Christians are are wrestling with that continuity and take it very seriously. And it seems to me that you could, you could explain, you know, the kind of family tree of Christianity and the, the major points of, of disagreement between Protestants and Catholics, Orthodox and Catholics, the various, you know, varieties of Protestants, uh, more liberal, more conservative, you could explain it exactly in those terms you've just used, you know, how, how are we uh, how do we achieve the, the most authentic continuity with the, the the values expressed in and the power of the cross, right? That's the heart of it. So it seems to me that all, all Christians would, would wrestle over the right to say that they are the ones accomplishing that. Point taken. Um, I'd be interested a little more in your story in a moment, but in the meantime, uh, as we see it reported, again from outside of America, people say four out of five evangelicals voted for Trump. And given that evangelicals are usually associated with a form of Christianity that says that, that pride in particular is something to be wary of, 
Um, C.S. Lewis was a great evangelical influence, and he wrote that pride uh, is, uh, lies at the heart of every failing, every sin. Uh, pursue humility uh, with all that you can muster and, and know that when you think you're making progress, you're not. Um, but if it's true that four out of five evangelicals voted for Trump, he looks to me, I think it would be fair to say, as somebody who's not terribly sympathetic to Christianity as, and in fact is a very proud man. Why, what was it that saw so many evangelicals vote for Trump and I think continue to support him today? There must be solid reasons, given that I would think many of them have questions around the way he lives his life, if I can put it that way. Right, yeah. I think there's a there's a value in kind of stepping back and um, questioning the ways in which maybe sometimes the media portrays the support of Trump by evangelicals as this very unique sort of ahistorical thing. I mean, if you look at the rate at which uh, evangelical voters supported George W. Bush, it's about the same uh, as, as their rate of support for Donald Trump. And so, you know, there's some piece of this that is more a story about unswerving loyalty to the Republican Party. And that is really not as much about Donald Trump. So it's a sort of different polarization story. I think too, I mean, evangelicals have have a long history of pragmatic political bargains, you know, so you can go back to the turn of the 19th century and look at the uh, bargain struck between Baptists and Thomas Jefferson, who was this notoriously heterodox, uh, you know, non, non-believer, right, who took the Bible and um, snipped out all the accounts of the miracles and the Gospels and just stuck, stuck with his account of Jesus as a moral figure. However, he and, and these uh, Baptist leaders found a lot of common ground when it came to the question of freedom of religion and a weakening of the established churches that had persisted past the revolution in the context of the individual states. They could agree on that. And, and so uh, he, he gained support from, from these evangelicals, even though you know, he, didn't, he did not share their beliefs or priorities in so many other ways. Now, you, you may fairly say, okay, that's all well and good. Tr- Trump seems different. And, and I think that this is, this, this is something that evangelicals themselves have been arguing furiously about uh, since 2015. Uh, it seems to me that, I mean, just in my, in my conversations with evangelicals, I mean, I meet plenty uh, who are absolutely clear-eyed when it comes to Trump's personal moral failings. And for many of them, their vote came down to his power to remake the composition of our Supreme Court, specifically when it comes to the issue of legal abortion. And indeed, he was true to his word and appointed conservative justices both at the Supreme Court level and also, and this doesn't get nearly the same attention, at lower levels in, their, in our federal uh, system of judgeships in a way that is, is already having profound consequences for American jurisprudence. And for American Christians who, who view abortion as murder, that is a fair deal. I mean, they, they accept his his moral failings. They don't, you know, they 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 don't support every policy, but they have a hierarchy of policies. Now that accounts for some of the support. I think too, we need to think more broadly about American Christianity when we pose the question, you know, is Donald Trump someone who lives in a consistent way with American Christianity? Donald Trump grew up uh, going to Marble Collegiate Church in New York City, pastored by Norman Vincent Peale whose most famous book is The Power of Positive Thinking, which is still in print. Norman Vincent Peale was the great apostle of of positive thinking, right? You know, pray and visualize the reality you want and you will have it. And he he is one of the godfathers of the tradition that that historians call the prosperity gospel. Uh, This idea that God wants his people to prosper in a material way. And if you live in the right way and you you know donate your money to the church, God will reward you materially. Uh, like so many uh, ideas in Christian history that one might call 
heretical or, or criticized from a certain angle, the prosperity gospel takes an idea that is present in scripture. So, you know, we do see God in scripture blessing his people, rewarding his people, and kind of runs with it out and blows it out of all proportion to the other messages in the gospel. So, but there's a way in which Donald Trump, uh, in his gift for kind of magical thinking and presenting a reality uh, that in which, you know, he and his followers are, are both, uh, you know, ha have been both victimized, but are now powerful and in making promises that are really exciting, you know, to, especially to kind of downtrodden blue collar workers who've lost their jobs, who've, who see uh, huge global economic shifts leaving them behind. Donald Trump can come and say, I am going to create, this is what he said in the lead up to the 2016 election, I'm going to create 25 million jobs. I am going to, you know, single-handedly restore the coal industry to Appalachia. I am going to, you know, knock down uh, the, you know, the, the sort of jerry-rigged public health system that uh, President Obama put in place through uh, the Affordable Care Act, and I'm going to replace it with something better, right? He can sort of spin off these very appealing promises in a way that has a kind of uh, a prosperity gospel character to it. So there's a sense in which if the prosperity gospel is one of the great American religious traditions, whether you like it or not, I mean, it, it is in terms of its influence, Donald Trump is, is, is a sort of uh, a, a very faithful <laughs> member of that church, you might, you might say. Uh, certainly someone who has, a, has an instinct for that, you know, that way of, of communicating with followers and, and bringing, bringing them into a new story of what their life will be like if they support him. You're painting uh, something of a gulf, I think, there, or a split, I would imagine, between many mainstream people who might be, in their own way, quite faithful, members of their local church, family, people and what have you, or they may not be, but they identify as evangelicals, but they're doing it tough. They're looking for someone to offer hope, versus the best traditions of American evangelical intellectual uh, leadership. I mean, there's a lot of very, very sophisticated thinking a very esteemed former high commissioner or, or uh, ambassador from Australia to um, to America, Kim Beasley, who was once a deputy prime minister, many people thought would become a prime minister of Australia. He made this point: don't overlook the intellectual credibility and 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 depth of much evangelical leadership in America. Uh, he made that comment to me when he'd returned. Um, there is a division there, isn't there? I mean, it must be quite difficult for many evangelical leaders who are worried about what you, I think, rightly identified as, as, as the mistake of prosperity gospel uh, thinking, um, because, you know, really the model of Christ is one of service. It's one of humility. It's one of um, often learning to be shaped and blessed through tough times, not good times, and that materialism in itself is is a terrible trap. So you're getting a gap opening up here, I would have thought, that that's quite revealing and quite troubling. Mm. In some ways, you're describing a sociological phenomenon that is is not unique to evangelicals, you know, that there there is in any uh, subculture, in any ideological, theological community, there, there is, there's always tension uh, between yeah. the kind of intelligentsia and lay people. Uh, so that's a broader pattern. However, I think you are absolutely onto something, and that there is a there's a deep history that is particular to American evangelical Protestantism that exacerbates what I'll call the broader American pattern of suspicion of elites and distrust of elites. You know, you can you can go back and and see. I mean, perhaps date the roots of this to the last third of the 19th century as uh, you know american evangelicals had to begin to interact with the developments in in biblical criticism and uh, the the way in which you know academic historians and archaeologists and you know uh, certainly biologists in the realm of of evolutionary science were were beginning to challenge traditional interpretations of scripture so there's this 
there's this um, tradition of distrusting elites and, and assuming that uh, el academic elites are operating on a set of presuppositions that are invalid that um, is not, you know, it's not, it's not wholly uh, without some basis in, in truth and that it, it, it is true that uh, the, the kind of modern research university that arose in Germany in the late 19th century and then has become the model for, for what um, modern universities are, you know, across bo both in Australia and, and in the United States and elsewhere, it absolutely is premised on a different notion of authority than that of traditional Christianity. However, I think there's a way in which that line of thinking uh, can become quite dangerous because it, it can give you a, a set of excuses to use to dismiss evidence that runs contrary to your preconceived notions, which is of course something that we know as humans, we are all prone to this. We're all prone to uh, our, having the, the first impulse to kick away evidence that undermines uh, worldviews and conclusions we already have. Uh, and we constantly have to fight. <laughs> We're not rational. We constantly have to fight uh, against our own tendencies. And I do think that evangelical Protestantism has a, has a history that makes its relationship with you know, the, the empirical work that uh, that is happening in in you know institutionalized uh, medical communities. You know, when if we look at kind of the co the COVID dynamics, uh, or uh, or in the universities more broadly, that just that just exacerbates that tension. And you know, I, I will say too that um, the the institutional elites uh, and um, kind of university culture is not is not without uh, a blame in this story. I think too, because I think there there is a way in which um, while uh, universities have kind of been on the left sociologically for for generations, I think there is a way in which uh, the pa in the past ten or fifteen years there has been a kind of narrowing um, in the range of kind of intellectual investigation and uh, the spectrum of, of ideological opinion that's at least openly expressed, um, and and so there that gulf that you describe between the sort of the intelligentsia. And, uh, and evangelicals um, at the lay level has gotten worse. And I see this, I mean, when I talk to my colleagues who teach at Christian colleges, um, you know, they, they are generally themselves con confessing evangelicals. Um, and, but they, they experience a version of this, you know, they're sort of caught between multiple worlds um, and, and they, they are having to navigate the dynamics of, you know, broader higher education, as well as the dynamics of, of their church communities and their alumni and their trustees. Molly, you yourself, uh, having studied these things, taught them for many, many years, um, have not, as I understand it, until recently personally identified with Christian faith, but more recently that's changed and you have yourself uh, come to believe in the truth uh, or that Christianity is true. Uh, can you um, tell us something about how that happened and, and uh, what drove it? Yeah, well, I'll give you the short version. It's a, it's a long, complicated story. I grew up in an entirely secular context, uh, not not exposed to, to Christianity in any systematic way, uh, got to college, uh, university, and began to feel very curious about, about Christianity, uh, especially Eastern Orthodoxy. I became very interested in Russian history. Um, I, I pivoted later to uh, the American context, but continually, you know, spent my, spent my adult life, I suppose, sidling up alongside Christianity, quite envious of these these people who had answers to the big the big existential questions who who had experiences of community that uh, I I had no access to, but I I couldn't find my own way into it. I, I made a couple of of uh, failed efforts, you know, to to become a Christian, but um, I, I couldn't I couldn't even get over the hump of theism, let alone faith in in Jesus. And so I was, you know, if we fast forward to about a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago, I suppose, I, I was in a place of kind of apathetic agnosticism. 
uh, subscribe broadly to the philosophy of the, the great pragmatist William James, you know, in that I liked to think that I, I was always open to revising my worldview on the basis of new evidence and um, holding my truth claims lightly, but but not really not not really getting anywhere with that. I I have been a journalist alongside my academic work um, for for many years. I was working on a magazine article about a local Baptist megachurch and uh, and its very successful pastor, who uh, had been uh, recently the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and in getting to know him, I, the short version is that he evangelized me. And he uh, got me onto a reading list focused particularly on the question of Christians' claims about the resurrection, the question of whether or not the resurrection actually happened and is the best explanation for the evidence from the early church that we have. And this was intellectually liberating for me because up to that point, I think I had been paralyzed by all of the all of the ways in which uh, beginning to investigate Christianity would immediately confront me with crazy things. Right? I mean, anytime you are approaching um, really any of the great religions from the outside, you're having to swallow an awful lot. Whether it's all of the miracle claims in the Bible, not not just the Jesus stuff, but you know the uh, you know the idea of heaven and hell, uh, the end times, um, uh, the predestination and free will, it's just it, it makes your brain want to explode. Here, I finally saw that in the case of Christianity, I could I could set so many of those intellectual challenges aside because it stands or falls on one question, and that is the resurrection. Was the tomb empty? Did Jesus rise from the dead? If he did, I can get there. I can go with him on who he says he is. And so I, I it was like writing another master's degree or something. I had this intense period of a few months where I was just devouring all sorts of uh, biblical scholarship, also doing reading on cosmology and, and trying to sort of get myself in a position to accept theism. Uh, taking taking furious notes, really having to constantly confront myself in my note taking with these conclusions I was reluctantly drawing because a, as I spent this time reading uh, very kind of serious um, Christian uh, uh, scholars of the New Testament, particularly N.T. Wright, his books were the big intervention for me. Also, some of the more kind of digestible popular books like Tim Keller's Reason for God alongside the work of skeptical biblical scholars. So I was I was really trying to you know pit these different schools of thought against each other. I was I was coming to the conclusion that if and this is crucial, if I was willing to let go of my anti-supernaturalist bias, if I was willing to suspend my disbelief in an interventionist God who could actually, uh, you know, interfere with our lives. And that was a huge hurdle. Then I, I was reluctantly getting to the point where the Christian account of the resurrection was an awful lot more plausible and an awful, uh, awful lot more uh, satisfying in the context of the evidence we have than I ever expected it to be. So I didn't have, and all this time I was, I was praying, going to church, going to this mega church. I never thought that I would be a, a mega church type. I always thought I would, you know, if, end up a respectable Anglican or Catholic or something like that. Um, but the stripped down presentation of the gospel that you get in in a reformed Baptist mega church was, I think, just what I needed. And I, you know, was working with this pastor, and and you know, he he recruited a couple of other people to kind of talk talk me through these things. I never had any. Uh, spiritual experience, you know, I, I wanted, would, it, would have been lovely if, you know, Jesus had just appeared at the foot of my bed and clarified everything. That didn't happen. What happened is that in just trying to be consistent with my own pragmatist philosophy, where, you know, I, I want to be willing to assimilate new evidence and change my worldview accordingly, I got to the point where I, I had to admit I was well north of 51% persuaded of the resurrection. And maybe the, the rest of the conviction 
and uh, feeling of assurance I wanted it comes with the experience of faith. It was not something that was reasonable to expect before taking that plunge. So I found myself in the unexpected position of, you know, being on stage at this at this big mega church while the worship band was playing, you know, getting baptized in the in the chlorinated, you know, jacuzzi sized tank. And <laughs> here I am still trying to figure out, you know, what it what it means now to be a kind of participant observer. I'd love to center in on what I understand was the critical issue for you for you. And I believe it is as well. I mean, it is an enormous thing to come to grips with the resurrection. And I hear people making all sorts of critiques of Christianity, arguing all sorts of issues as to why they believe or can't believe or whatever. That seemed to me to be of far lesser importance, even the ideas of people walking on water fail, pale into insignificance beside the idea of of a Christ rising from the dead. Uh, that really is extraordinary, isn't it? And, and, and everything hinges on that. If it's true, it's the most profound thing in human history. If it's not, countless millions of people who thought it was true and the central thing in history actually have been misled and have wasted their lives. It's as profound as that. Could you narrow down just a little more on your thoughts as to why it's critical and, and what point can you identify a point at what point in your life when you thought in your intellectual and, and and if you like emotional journey you thought i actually think on balance this is right because a very big step isn't it <laughs> yes yes it is a big step the resurrection is not just the the big miracle next to all the other miracles it's not different purely in scale uh, compared to, you know, Jesus feeding the, the 5,000 or healing lepers, restoring the sight to the blind. The resurrection is categorically different. The resurrection is, is the way by which Christians believe Jesus has undone all, all of the evil that came, came with original sin. So, so it, it is, it is, it's the core of, of the Christian faith in a way that sets it apart from the relationship that other, other religious believers might have to miracle claims that, that they make. Um, and I think that that's, that's a distinction that I didn't understand until I started investigating it more recently, even though I, I've been a historian of Christianity for, for quite a long time. Uh, it, it's also it's also an event that you know, considering it, it is said to have happened two thousand years ago, we have a, a surprisingly large amount of surprisingly high quality textual evidence. And I think there were a few things that happened. One is is that you know, as I revisited the Gospels in this process of seeking, and of course I I read the Bible plenty, but I, as I revisited in this kind of new mindset, I began to react to the weirdness of scripture, uh, to the way in which it so often has the quality of, not of mythology, not, not a fable, but of you know, baffled human authors desperately trying to make sense of these bizarre things that happened. Uh, I was especially struck by, upon rereading, the, the descriptions of Jesus's healings, especially in the Gospel of Mark, and how each one is so different and so strange. You know, Jesus, you know, uh, taking um, taking a man aside and you know, kind of spitting and making mud with his fingers and and pressing mud onto his eyes, or you know, it, it taking a couple of tries to get the blind man at, at Bethsaida, you know, who initially sees trees walking to have his full sight and see people. Um, they don't follow a, f a formula. So, so there's this way, and, and C.S. Lewis says something similar in his account of his conversion. There's this way in which, you know, at, I just began to react to the go to the Gospels as a as as a historian um, and, and developing a sense of kind of trust in them as documents. Now, I'm not someone who trusts my instincts my you know my gut reaction to a document is not is not a valuable source of empirical evidence right so i was 
persuaded by uh, the scholarship of people like N.T. Wright, uh, Richard Bauckham, who um, make the case, uh, Craig Blomberg is another scholar uh, in the US who's done a lot of work on this, who make the case for um, a, a, an understanding of, of the gospel accounts as being quite a lot closer to the experiences of the eyewitnesses, if not necessarily written by eyewitnesses themselves, than um, many scholars believed you know, earlier in the 20th century. And I think this is a, this is a view that um, it has, has gained more and more credence among uh, biblical scholars. The big argument that N.T. Wright makes in his giant book, The Resurrection and the Son of God, is through the accumulation of you know, 800 pages of, of evidence, he, he sketches out for you the milieu of first century uh, Jewish belief and practice uh, in its broader Hellenistic context. And he makes the case that whatever Jesus' followers might have imagined or fantasized about or dreamed uh, would happen in the context of Jesus's crucifixion, it wasn't the bodily resurrection. It wasn't this. Uh, it is. It is a completely. It, it's a. It's a. It's an event, a phenomenon that violated all of the sort of cultural and ideological expectations about when resurrection would happen, who it would happen to, whether it would concern the body, what that would even mean. And you know, this is another area in which the sheer weirdness of the gospel accounts made a huge impression on me. I mean, if you if you study the accounts of the resurrected Jesus in his appearances to his disciples, they are they are so strange. They are not descriptions of a of a ghostly figure. They're not descriptions of a normal human body reanimated like you or me. They are, um, you know, I, I think N.T. Wright's term is something like transphysical, right? They're, they are a Jesus who is uh, sometimes recognizable, but not, not quite the same, who can kind of pass through doors and yet can also stand on the beach and fry up a fish breakfast, right? So uh, there, is, there is a sheer bizarreness to it that, that deeply impressed me. And and made it made it and this is perhaps counterintuitive, but made it more more plausible to me. And I I also had to confront this is the other piece of it how deep my own epistemological grooves were, and how um, I I am I, I had been operating in a very sort of blinkered uh, worldview that is really d willfully ignorant of the experience of reality as reported by the majority of, of humans when it comes to the supernatural. Directly after my conversion, my next big kind of research project was uh, an investigation of reports of miraculous healing claims. And so I spent time, you know, reading uh, scholarly, uh, um, the, you know, accounts of, you know, the, the, preponderance of, of some of the better testified claims of healing, interviewing scholars who have done, you know, as, as close as you can get to kind of scientific empirical investigation of, uh, you know, the healing of blind and deaf people in, you know, re revivals in Mozambique. It's hard, you can't do, you know, a controlled experiment, but there are people who've gotten as close as you could possibly imagine to that, interviewing them, talking to, you know, uh, Christians from other other national contexts who have a very different relationship with the supernatural. I mean, something like, you know, 80 or 90 percent of people who become Christian in places like Myanmar and China report personal experience with healing, with miraculous uh, healing. Now, Yes, you can write off some proportion of, of those reports as wishful thinking, hallucination, sure. However, was I really willing to dismiss the testimony of millions of people? I got to a point where I couldn't. And so once you, once you destabilize that, uh, that anti-supernaturalist bias, that is really quite particular to, to this historical location, you know, sort of modern Western technological society, that, that opened up uh, ways of thinking about causation that I think changed how I had to view claims about the resurrection. 
That is a fascinating journey that you've described, and I'm sincerely hoping that many people tap into it uh, here, as I'm sure they have in other places. Thank you for being so honest with it. Um, it's a stark contrast, it seems, with the the seriousness with which you've engaged with these issues, and I think Christianity does require that seriousness, with the sort of therapeutic culture that we, we now live in, where I, one sociologist a, a few years ago described the basic American zeitgeist or, or the sort of well, um, spirit of the age, if you like, as therapeutic moral deism. In other words, God exists, but what he wants for us is to be basically happy and crucially to feel good about ourselves. No sin, no repentance. There is a vast gulf, I think, between the depth of the real struggle that people, that you've just described, that I think that honesty requires in the face of this enormous and extraordinary claim and our desire to find meaning and purpose. As C.S. Lewis sort of said, if we hunger, it's because there's food there. If we want something deeper, it's because we were made for something deeper. And I suppose what I'm saying is I'm decrying the superficiality of much of the debate at the moment around what we believe and, and, and how we find hope. How do we encourage people to think more deeply? Because it's not as if things are working out well at the moment in your culture or in mine. The numbers show you that. People are not enjoying themselves. They're anxious. Mental health, health is, is, is under serious challenge. It seems we need a bigger story, but we're frightened of anything that might require sacrifice on our behalf, if I can put it that way. That's absolutely right. Uh, and gosh, I mean, I, I don't want to valorize my, my own uh, struggles with this because, you know, I'm a creature of this culture like we all are. And so I am, I am really in a period right now of trying to sit at the feet of, you know, the Puritan theologians I'm reading, you know, people like St. Augustine try, to try to begin to, to, to think about what it means to submit to authority in this way that, as you say, is so foreign to the way our culture trains us to think. I mean, there's a there's a kind of ironic way in which I think the moral therapeutic deism that the sociologist Christian Smith used to describe our culture is is in some ways, you know, if you take the long, long view, it, there is a continuity between our current situation and the Protestant Reformation. As much as, you know, Martin Luther and John Calvin would be horrified to, to, to hear that suggested, uh, there is an individual turn that, that happened in, with the Reformation. Now, quite immediately, it, it did not. You know, in the, in the case of, of the immediate followers of, of Martin Luther and John Calvin, uh, certainly for them, it entailed a deeper submission to um, divine authority, biblical authority, in many cases, institutional authority. But it set the stage for this long range transformation uh, in which we become more and more atomized, more and more untethered from any sense of submission or duty to any entity larger than ourselves. You know, we we think in the West, we we so many of us think of freedom purely in terms of what you know Isaiah Berlin famously called negative liberty, right? Like freedom has to do with a, an absence of any outside forces impinging on me. Freedom is about me being able to act on whatever impulse I have as long as I don't, you know, impinge on your freedom to do the same, right? Um, that's, that's a very uh, particular Western uh, narrow and I think frankly naive way to think about freedom. I mean, it, it posits, it, it assumes that we all have inside us this sort of uh, glowing ember of a flame of authenticity that we're born with. And life is about blowing on that flame and nurturing it and getting it to flourish. And that's what freedom is. When really our, our notion of what authentic selfhood is, our ideas about the categories of identity and fulfillment and flourishing open to us, those are given to us by our culture. Those are not innate. They deserve to be interrogated. They deserve to be put into conversation with uh, the worldviews and, and philosophies of, of people who came before us and people in other cultures. 
And you are absolutely right about the mental health crisis, I mean, especially on college campuses. I think students are driving change. Students are hungry for something much more substantial than what they've been getting. So, you know, I have noticed um, a kind of proliferation, at least in American academia, of courses with titles like The Good Life, Happiness, you know, what, what is human flourishing? Now, some of them, I think, are a little bit superficial, are, are kind of in the vein of pop psychology and uh, how do you optimize, you know, your, your, your daily routine? And that's nonsense. That's not useful. Um, but a, a significant proportion of them, I think, have to do more with getting students to read big books, big, hard, old books from a range of, of perspectives that grapple with these questions. I mean, humans have not changed, right? Like you go back and you read, uh, you know, the accounts of, you know, you read someone like St. Augustine, you read his confessions and, uh, and, and read him wrestling with temptation and, you know, this, the desire to do something bad just for the badness of it. And, you know, not listening to his mother and uh, the, the kind of existential wandering from one philosophy to another before he finally uh, discovers Christianity. There is something so deeply modern about it. You go back and read, you know, monks uh, chronicling in the fourth century, talking about distraction and how hard it is for them to focus on their reading and their prayers. And I mean, yes, they didn't have smartphones. So, you know, they had they had it perhaps a bit easier, but there there is some common human experience there that we need to learn from. And I, what I tell my students is, you know, yes, one of the lovely things about America is the, the huge range of spiritual options and the absolute smorgasbord of metaphysical possibilities you have open to you. And no one cares if you, you know, practice Wicca one day and, you know, learn how to use crystals another day and then maybe do some Zen uh, Buddhist meditation and then maybe dabble in, in Christian prayer on Friday. You can do that. But if you really want what you're talking about when you use the word freedom, you need to submit to a tradition for a while. You need to put yourself under its authority and do it and worship with those people, pray with them, read their books and entertain the possibility that your gut reaction to something doesn't necessarily carry the weight of truth. And that, you know, maybe what is most outrageous about some of these older philosophies is what's truest about them, right? And especially in the case of Christianity, there has never been a historical era, including the first century, when some piece of Christianity wasn't absolutely a scandal, wasn't completely outrageous in the context of mainstream morality. And that is no more true of our time now than it was in the first century. And, and so we need to get over what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, I think. And we can we can celebrate all the ways in which humans have made progress and, and have improved the lot of our species relative to uh, experiences in the past, while also maintaining a humble posture and remembering that we have a lot to learn from people who came before us. Molly, on that note, thank you so very, very much indeed for challenging us. I really appreciate it. And I, and I hope it uh, is helpful to many people. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun.